All right, everyone, let's get going. So thank you again for joining us, Consumer Priorities, Innovating on New Need States. We just want to let you know in advance that as we dug into this material, it was quite extensive and um, in typical EBCO form, we really didn't want to leave anything out. So this is a long deck. So we might, based on engagement today, we may go over the hour. Um, if we do, as always, you will get the recording to all of the content if you're not able to stay on with us. Um, or if it seems like people really do need to move on to their next meeting, we may pause it and do a second session. So bear with us as we get through some really interesting content today. We are asking ourselves, what are new consumer priorities and how can we innovate on new need states? We know that jobs to be done, new need states are really critical to the innovation process. And that's why we came up with this topic, using Maslow's hierarchy of human needs with a combination of our trend analysis and behavioral insights, we're identifying what the causes are of recent shifts in consumer preferences, in consumers' attitudes, and in their behaviors, and therefore identifying new white space opportunities. And for those of you who are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy, my background in anthropology as a social scientist, Maslow's means a ton to us. And so it's just really interesting to live in a time, a very unique time, I should say, where Maslow's hierarchy seems to be more applicable than ever. Today, we are going to be focusing on our new COVID world at a glance, which I know is a topic we've all been grappling with how COVID changed consumer priorities, and then understanding the new need states, everything from physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization and where we are today. A little bit about us as we dig in here, for those of you who haven't joined us before, we always love seeing new people get on. EBCO is an Austin-based trend and insight consulting firm. We work with companies across all categories. We have clients in all major industries, and we work on understanding the momentum and movement that's happening in their industry specific to strategic initiatives so that we can do custom programming to really identify where those opportunities are for our clients. And we work with them by identifying new growth opportunities. We build custom trend networks. We enable decision-making and prioritization and delivering actionable recommendations. And we're hoping that Today on our webinar, you will get a sense of the type of work that we do. And real quick, just in terms of our work that we've been engaging with during this period of COVID, we've been doing a ton of COVID industry trends. Clients have really found a need to explore this space and we're real happy to jump on it. Um, it's been a really interesting time to look at how trends are shifting and moving so quickly. But what's even more interesting, and we'll touch on it today, is how quickly consumer behaviors are changing. And for those of us who have been studying consumers for so long, we know that typically that takes a long time to see that, that change, but we are seeing that and that's something that we've been studying. The world as we know it, it's been flipped upside down in a matter of months and there's so many different things coming on and we have this new reality that we're all living in. And something that we can all agree on is that consumers have changed dramatically and that's what we're here to study today. So one question, how do we reframe our perspective to see opportunities in everything that we've been experiencing these last few months. Great, so in terms of some of the top industries at risk, we've obviously probably all heard about travel and leisure for those of you that, that work in those spaces that have been highly impacted by COVID. When we think of airlines, food service, hotels, restaurants, one of the most interesting things that we've even seen is that food service and healthcare workers are actually the top industries where most workers have been displaced. So there's been some interesting industries that are ultimately impacted, even though there's a high need and demand for those types of services. And we also see with, you can see this exposure wheel in terms of industries that have a high exposure to changes during COVID, moderate exposure or low exposure. There's been a lot of businesses that also see sort of a COVID bump in terms of positive enforcement right now with consumers either stocking up or buying a lot more products since they're at home during the day or consuming a lot of media and content. So that's something that we'll be talking about as we go throughout this, where we're seeing opportunities, where we're seeing some transitioning right now, where we're seeing innovation happening out of necessity, which is a topic that we, that we covered before as well. We also see that consumers are cautious about going back to normal. While local governments may be relaxing restrictions and opening businesses, consumers are much more conservative about their planned activities in the future. So we thought this is a pretty interesting way to think about how different activities, what might be the average time needed to return. 
So you can see like take a cruise, <laughs> which I have to say is probably not um, the highest priority on most people's list, just in terms of feeling safe and secure during that experience. You can see that most consumers have said it would take a year or longer to return to that activity. Other activities like flying on a plane, visiting a casino, staying in a hotel or going to a sporting event, they anticipate within four to six months, this might be something that they feel like they'll be feel safe to return to. Going to a gym class, going out to dinner, hosting, attending a large social gathering, going to the movies, taking pub public transit or greeting people at the handshake two to three months and going back to the office anticipated one to 30 days. And you can see this was from the Harris poll. So if you're interested in learning more about how they conducted this study, who they polled and when, this would be something that we recommend you take a deeper look at. But overall, just interesting that consumers are a few steps behind what we see in terms of a government approach to going back to normal, depending on which state they might live in. Yeah, and it's just about balancing what consumers are thinking versus what opens up. Just because cruises have started launching over the summer doesn't necessarily mean everyone's going to go for it. And that's something to really consider. Yeah, and it's even interesting when you dovetail into some of these subcategories in the industries, just thinking about what the future might look like for a child care center. When you think of valet services, um, even like we saw one state opened up tattoo artists and tattoo parlors already. So thinking about that's interesting that that was one of like the first set of businesses that were allowed to open in that state. So we had some pretty interesting discussion about like, how is that like one of the most top ones that was safe enough to open? Uh, but interesting to think about how a lot of these industries will have to pivot when we think of the future of education at universities and college, also what the value equation is for a student um, in terms of, of all virtual education. Does that still fit into the college experience that they wanted? When you think of beauty salons and spas, we've talked about on past webinars where we see like curbside root touch-ups or do-it-yourself kits at home that they actually prepare for you or different ways that they can mitigate the risk of transmission. But overall, a lot of these industries are thinking about ways that they can pivot during this time and still offer their services to the consumer or find an alternative way to service them. So the coronavirus has shifted consumer needs in a big way, and that's what's happened through all of this, and that's where Maslow's hierarchy comes in. So looking at the hierarchy here, consumers pre-COVID, we know that a lot of marketing and a lot of brand relationships with their consumers were around esteem and self-actualization. How can we be the best, most fullest potential version of ourselves? How can we have that feeling of accomplishment? What types of products and services are going to help me achieve that? And things like in the physiological level, the safety level, and belonging and love were more or less established, at least in a general landscape of our culture. I mean, everyone struggles through their own individual levels here throughout life as we go through different experiences. But for the most part, we saw a lot of, lot of targeting at, the, at those top levels. And now with COVID uh, and everything that we've been experienced, we've seen a major whiplash where the pendulum has swung in this other direction where physiological, the food that we need, you know, feeling safe and secure, what's happening with our relationships. I'm sure all of us can relate to these three levels right now and think about it. When we start seeing empty shelves at the grocery store, people panic a little bit in ways that they have maybe in their lifetime never specifically felt. Or what about safety? Every single day questioning whether or not a decision I'm making to go to a grocery store or now that my governor, for instance, in my state says it's okay to go out, is that the safest decision for me or for maybe my someone who's elderly who's more compromised or safe for my children? Should I send my children back to school? And then belonging and love. So I mean, there's people who have been separated now for two, three months and not just separated in terms of quarantine, but separated in hospitals or dire situations or nursing homes where you're really separated in a way that um, is essentially heartbreaking. So we're seeing now and post COVID that consumers have their mindset has moved to this lower portion of the pyramid. And it's something that really needs to be considered in how we market and the products that we're thinking about and what really matters to consumers. So while the economic fallout has been significant, we also need to focus on how brands can focus on a higher level priorities where consumers have these physiological and safety needs that need to be addressed. And today's innovation needs to look at this full spectrum of hierarchy of human needs, not just at the top, not just aspirational. And, and you know, it's very important to mention that it doesn't mean that we won't swing back in that direction. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a, a portion of the population who is still successful in this moment, meaning 
their jobs or their industries growing or their or their world has more or less stayed consistent. So it's still important to address those higher levels of esteem and actualization, but we want to take more of a focus across these, all of these levels. So today we're going to think about innovation through the lens of Maslow's hierarchy during and post COVID. So some of the areas we'll cover include physiological needs when we think about basic needs and meeting those requirements, thinking about safety and how the situation for most has proved how little control we actually do have in this world. So looking for new senses of security in the face of the unknown. We'll talk about belonging and love. So while belonging and being part of a larger collective was important pre-COVID, social distancing and isolation have intensified our needs for real connection. I've seen a lot of stories on social media and also talking with others where they've said they've had conversations with friends and loved ones that they might not have had for years. There's actually a really popular tweet going around of, of somebody talking to their mom every day when they hadn't for years talked to her that much. And so it's just been interesting to see all this connection come out from something that seemingly makes us feel like we're disconnected. Esteem needs. So looking at the prioritization of self, which we were seeing a lot pre-COVID in terms of our striving for steam and self-actualization in terms of our career and lifestyle goals. And now it's coming into conflict with the greater good. We've obviously seen that, especially in the US, we're very highly focused on individualism and um, being an individual. And how does that conflict with needing to solve for the greater good and come together as a society and do what's right to help everyone around us? And then self-actualization. So thinking about how our personal potential is really challenged during this time and a lot of our goals. There's even a famous, another famous social media meme going around around, I guess 2020 won't be my year. So this joke that you might've had high aspirations for what 2020 would look like in terms of your travel goals, in terms of work, in terms of maybe moving and sort of that's been shattered essentially and taken out of the realm. But we've also seen a focus back on what kind of personal hobbies do I have that I've never had time to explore that I could dig into right now during COVID? So it's an interesting contrast and something that we'll talk about in relation to the pyramid and the hierarchy of needs that we'll discuss today. So as you know, if you've joined us before, we love our polls and polls are totally anonymous. So some of the topics we're covering, to, covering today are a little bit more personal than we typically cover, but if you're comfortable participating, have you and or your family's position on the Maslow's hierarchy shifted because of coronavirus? We have yes, we have no, and we have not sure. Now this is totally anonymous, you know, so if you're, you're willing to participate, I see a lot of answers coming in. Thank you so much. Um, this is super interesting. So what we're seeing here is 70, wow, okay, it's changing real fast. Lots of input. 80% of you, 77%, okay, it's shifting, but 70, over 75% of you are saying yes, that in fact your needs in terms of how you think about this for your family, your position has changed during this time, which is really phenomenal. So 78% is where we ended it. And some of you aren't sure, but that is super interesting. So you can just imagine how that maps to the greater population, you know, because we are all representative of the people who are out there and trying to make our lives make sense during this time. Yeah, really interesting. So as we just saw, most of us are reevaluating the criteria of our most basic needs and rethinking what, what safety, what security might mean to us, what um, new behaviors we might be taking on during this time. We're going to start with the lowest level of the pyramid, which focuses on around physiological needs. So I'm sure all of us have heard of these or have thought of these considering their requirements for our survival, but thinking of things like air, water, food, shelter, sleep and rest and recovery, clothing, reproduction, and Maslow's hierarchy paints the picture that these needs must be satisfied first in order to move on to other levels. And what's interesting is, I was even looking at this list and thinking pre-COVID, what's interesting is that innovation already is rampant in a lot of these spaces. So you think of water, you think of like enhanced waters, water infused with electrolytes, water that helps with recovery, water that has increased hydration. We're continuing to see water be this platform that continually gets innovation because we you know, need to consume so much of it to survive even in air, so air filtration, different types of technologies that help clean the air in your home, even plants now being used as air purifiers. So there's some really interesting innovation that already happens even when we're not at this level of a crisis. But what's happened now with COVID is that's really flipped it back to these are the basic things we need to survive and sort of going back to basics in terms of our mentality and realizing that some of these things we do take for granted. And when we have to refocus on them, 
there's different ways to consider these in a different perspective that we take on it. And we've even seen that with a lot of hoarding and stockpiling behaviors and ultimately what makes us feel safe at the end of the day. So why is this important? We see that COVID has forced many Americans specifically to rethink their basic needs and the criteria needed to meet them. Millions of Americans are taking a hard look at necessities and what they consider essential during these times. Obviously there's a global lens of COVID, but in terms of a lot of the examples we have curated here, we have focused more on the US market in terms of the innovation we're seeing. So just wanted to point that out for anyone who is calling in today from a different destination. But a lot of these learnings we say apply across the board and can just really depend on the exact nature that the net, exact impact that COVID has had on that specific country. So at this level of Maslow's hierarchy, what has happened that impacts this space? News of impending shutdowns and social isolation caused everyone to engage in panic buying. So store shelves were empty. Like I said earlier in the presentation, this could have been for the first time ever in people's lives to feel that bit of panic, especially if you didn't have enough stockpile at home or you have a larger family. And so consumers are experiencing this empty store, uh, store shelves and it's reinforcing this basic notion that you might not have access to what you need, which is a, a very impactful feeling that people have had. Also communal living situations, thinking about dorm residences, nursing homes, where people are collectively work, living together in the same hallways. And we've seen that this has been, or, and we saw this on the cruises. So, you know, understanding that the breeding grounds for coronavirus in these closed tight places are very real. They're talked about over and over in the news. And so consumers, even those who are having financial trouble are considering what are the health implications of living in this type of shelter or this type of living environment? And then finally, spurred by reports that coronavirus could spread through city water systems, people were starting to think about, do I need filtered water? Do I need to think about where I'm getting these nutrients? And then now we're even seeing some basic needs like protein might be even becoming scarce because we're hearing about the meat packing uh, plants are shutting down. We're also hearing that there's an excess supply of meat out there, but there's no one to organize it, pack it operationally and get it into the stores. So these are new topics that people are grappling with at the lowest, the lowest level of the pyramid. So now we're gonna dig into each section that we cover. We're gonna cover a key mindset shift that we're seeing with consumers during this time. And then we're gonna talk about innovations in terms of products that were already out there that are getting a spike in terms of demand and surge of interest. Some things that have been created in response to COVID, and then also future ideas for innovation. So things that on the line we can all think about based on the categories we might work in or the industries, how those could potentially be thought starters for territories and areas that we could innovate on to help with this new mindset shift or even innovate post COVID. So the first one we'll cover today is around, I need to build some self sufficiency skills, whether it's gardening or baking to ensure I can always provide for myself and my family no matter what. So that really speaks to what Aaron just covered in terms of feeling like you know food is not as accessible, feeling like you have to maybe question basic systems that you used to rely on. Um, just going to the grocery store kind of on the drop of a dime might not be as accessible as it once was if you're not sure that you can get what you need. So in terms of some current innovations, we see consumers flocking towards grow and raise your own solutions that can help supplement their household's food supply. So gardening, um, raising chickens, creating your own bread and bread machines have all of a sudden spiked seemingly overnight. So we see around this theme around emergency gardening. So being able to garden and supplement your food supply or feel more self-sufficient. We see poultry and livestock starter kits, um, chickens being sold out, thinking about animal acquisitions during this time. We've seen a lot of livestock and interest in domesticated animals. And then also bake your own bread kits. Um, so bread machines are sold out on a lot of e-commerce websites. Um, I tried to buy one for my mother-in-law for Mother's Day and I could not find one anywhere. So that was a really interesting kind of experience that I went through. And then also we see companies even doing these sourdough starter kits that you can get locally from your farmer's market or from a company there. Um, even restaurants that are closed down and they're offering these sourdough kits to their consumers to help bake that bread at home. So just a research interest in all of these areas. And some future ideas is that we see consumers will take action to assert more control over their food supply to eliminate potential shortages and also increase this idea of having self-sufficiency. So we see that with innovation in terms of fresh produce supply at home. So I would say pre-COVID, we were seeing companies dabble in this space. At South by Southwest last year, even Zoe Deschanel had a hydroponic gardening system that you could buy. I think it was 
pretty pricey. It was between a thousand and two thousand, but it was something that helped help help guarantee your gardening supply um, indoors throughout the year, depending on where you live. We see more innovations happening. Some of it in commercial in LA, they have repurposing trailers and different types of warehouses to start growing food underground. Um, there's been a lot of talk even about Amazon and Walmart rumored to potentially be looking into that as well. Um, so we see just more innovation in this space and even growing kits and personal greenhouses. We also see direct-to-consumer farm products. So consumers embracing direct-to-consumer platforms that connect them with local farmers or co-ops. There's even been a lot of inspiring stories online of farmers posting that they're going to have to throw away milk or other items and consumers sort of flocking as a way to help support those farmers and helping get them onto a platform where they can actually purchase products from them and help to offset that. And then back to essentials cooking, which we covered with bread as an example, packaged bread, consumers are really turning back to doing it themselves while they have all this extra time instead of pre-made solutions. So that's been sort of a trade-off with convenience is going back to doing it yourself or finding a system at home that works for you and honing your essential cooking skills. The next mindset shift that we'll cover is seeing healthy people get sick has made me realize I need to prioritize the strength and resiliency of my immune system. So this one makes a lot of sense given um, that COVID does impact your respiratory system, but also thinking about our immunity overall and how we could help safeguard ourselves. So we see immunity boosters, elixirs, and supplements. Even pre-COVID um, were really popular as part of this larger wellness movement. But now we see that really starting to gain more traction as people look to what they can actually do to help safeguard themselves and also protect their families. So we see this in the format of immunity and wellness shots, immunity smoothie kits, and even immunity vitamins for kids. And I love that um, this Hello Bello, the marketing language is around this being a security blanket gummy for kids that helps the body prepare for pathogen fighting. So we're seeing more marketing language geared towards this idea of helping protect the body from viruses and other types of infections. So in terms of future ideas, we see consumers will adopt more holistic lifestyle regimens and practices to boost and protect their immune system. So we could see immunity diets really getting the lifestyle treatment. We've seen lifestyle diets like keto and paleo popular in recent years. Keto was the number one diet of 2019 as an example. But really, there's this going to be this renewed focus around immunity lifestyles and eating for overall immunity and wellness. If you've ever been to True Food Kitchen, it's a restaurant that we've loved to go on for past expeditions and also for personal, for per personal exploration. And their whole diet is based on this idea of immunity eating. So having ingredients like elderberry and kale and some other turmeric and ginger infused throughout the menu as a way to help boost your overall well-being and lifestyle. Immunity boosting workouts. So exercise and workout has really gotten a halo effect from COVID and exercise itself is known to be a beneficial immune system booster. So we expect to see more immunity centric workout classes and routines and this idea that you're working out as a way to help boost your overall health and wellness, not just for a specific fitness goal. And then finally, immunity air purifiers. So we had talked about air kind of being this idea around a basic necessity, and we've seen a lot of innovation in this territory already where a lot of different types of filter technologies and this focus on clean air and how it can overall impact your health and even like cancer hot zones in the U.S., depending on where you live and if you're near a freeway um, and off-gassing. But now we expect to see more focus on even daily exposure to pathogens and focus on eliminating germs and what new formats and devices could ultimately help accomplish that. The last mindset shift, shift we'll get into is getting good sleep as a preventative practice to ward off illness and disease. So sleep innovation is one of our favorite topics. I have to say I'm somebody that takes melatonin every night um, and I can really buy into a lot of these formats and even at Expo West, we've seen increasingly more companies exhibit every year that focus on sleep and recovery and how, because we spend so much of our time sleeping, it's really an area where we can focus on sort of this last frontier of wellness innovation. So in terms of some current things we see in the market, we see rest inducing aromatics. Um, so this Goop product is actually for your bathtub that helps promote a restful deep sleep. We see sleep promoting beverages like Som Sleep, which help consumers fall asleep and stay asleep. I've tried this product and it literally knocks you out. It's almost like drinking like three glasses of wine. You basically go to bed as soon as you take it. 
And then also Moon Juice, where they have an adaptogenic blend of super herbs that help fight stress to ensure a restful night's sleep. So sleep and stress are usually two closely linked territories that we see on our end. And one that especially given this time, you can imagine a large, pop, a large proportion of us are dealing with stress and anxiety during COVID. So we imagine these will also be linked when we think of future ideas for innovation and what that next frontier of stress management might look like. In terms of some other future ideas that we see, we really see this moving beyond consumables. So especially with some of us working inside right now and even thinking about what the future of work from home might look like, we expect to see more circadian rhythm products that use light therapy to help deal with things like winter blues to help us regulate sleep, fight fatigue, boost mood and improve focus. Especially if we're not getting as much activity or exercise during the day, if we're just um, staying at home and not having that normal commute as well as office time where we might interact with others and walk around. We also see potentially daily light tracking wearables that would track our light exposures to help us get a better understanding of why our mood might feel not as great one day versus another, why we might not be getting as much vitamin D exposure as we need. So we see more of this area around digital health and wellness coming into the home, especially now that we're spending so much time here. Um, and then you can see this last um, one, which is a little more far reaching, but even sleep robots that could become a potential sleep accessory. So working almost like a white noise machine, but this is something that you can actually interact with. Yeah, and just to wrap up that section, there were some comments in the chat box about city dwellers versus suburbia. And while we don't exactly know yet how much of a movement people might actually be moving out of cities and just for me to space themselves out, we definitely know that there will be behavior changes in terms of how people are living in these tighter quarters. So um, if you do have some comments, if you do want to engage, please put them in the chat box. I like that there was a little bit of back and forth here, but there's definitely a lot of content to get, get through. So um, please feel free to um, engage as you wish. Great, so the next one we'll go through is safety needs. So coronavirus proved how little control we have over our world. Consumers are desperate for a sense of security in the face of the unknown. Um, so this one I can definitely relate to. Um, being a little type A sometimes, it, it definitely felt like a lot of my options were taken away from me during this time. Um, it's something that we have seen sort of resonate with consumers, this idea that um, we have to find control in areas that we can. Um, and so we're going to start with a poll for this section and then move on to some of the examples we're seeing. Yeah, so again, this is anonymous. If you're open to sharing, we'd love to see it. During this period of time, have you participated in telehealth physical appointment, a mental health appointment, or another virtual healthcare service? It could be meditation, it could be personal care, something that, you know, helps you, but you're doing it at a distance, more than one of the above or none of the above at all. And feel free to answer this if you have uh, a partner or a child or someone older that you're caring for that may have used this, just curious how much engagement we're seeing. Because as we talk to clients and, and others that are in the healthcare industry, we're seeing that what's amazing is there's this sudden awareness of telehealth that has never been so prevalent before. Of course, telehealth has, has been a long, uh, around for a while, I should say, but the awareness and the willingness to engage in it is unprecedented. And that overlaps with things like online school and virtual classes and a lots of this other type of engagement that we're seeing right now. And so it looks like with, the, with everyone who's joining us here, 16% of you have done a physical health appointment, 13% a mental mental health appointment, 10%, some other type of service, whether it's meditation, personal care, or something else. Um, some of you, a few of you have done more than one of the above. So just really interesting to see that there is this level of engagement in, across the individuals on this call. And then 60% of you almost haven't done it yet. So we'll see how that changes either in the next few months or even permanently moving forward. Yeah, and just a, um, just a comment on some of the chat questions coming in and comments about moving to the suburbs during this time or wanting to like maybe hunker down in a country location. I think one interesting trend we are seeing is really this focus on the backyard space during this time and things that we can do to enhance our home. Um, we've seen a lot of um, even like swing sets. If you try to look up a swing set right now and purchase it, you're probably going to have a hard time. Um, I was trying to buy one and it's almost impossible to find them right now. So there's certain like larger purchases that consumers have made, which do require yard space. Um, so I could imagine, and if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll experience long lines out the door. 
um, they are seeing quite a boost in terms of paint sales. So people are doing renovations and things that you, you know, would think correlate to potentially wanting more space or potentially wanting to enhance your property. So things that do tend to correlate with um, having more space and being outside of a city environment. So the next section that we're looking into are safety needs. So personal safety needs have moved beyond tangible enemies to those that promote the ability to control more aspects of our lives. So when we looked into this section, we know that humans have a primal need for safety and security, that people want to experience order, predictability, and control in their daily lives. So when we think about the products and the services that we are launching to help support people during this time and well into the future when we're planning six to 12 months out, five to, five to seven years out, we can start thinking about what order, predictability, and control mean to people. And so they need those, they need themselves cared for through certain structures, whether that's schools, hospitals, the police, city and state governments, to make them feel safe. And why is this important? Because right now COVID is this untouchable enemy. No one really knows how to stop it. Words can't stop it, walls, uh, weaponry. And at this point, even in the health system, we don't have a cure or a vaccine or a medication to help us get through this time. So the suddenness of this across the globe has had everyone questioning their day-to-day -day rituals and habits to think, am I being as safe as I can? Crowded security areas and packed airplanes were one of the hot spots, same with the cruises. So germ exposure and transmission is a new safety concern that people haven't at this level considered before. Also looking to stop the spread of coronavirus in densely populated cities, which we've touched on in our, in our chat box. Um, in other regions, these checkpoints and preventing outside residents, like if someone wants to fly from Michigan or California into Texas, for instance, you have a 14-day quarantine. So this definition of freedom, individual liberty has been pitted against collective action for the greater good. So people are questioning, is freedom and liberty part of my health and wellness and my ability to be safe? Or is staying home and thinking about the greater good the best way to be safe? So there's a lot of questioning and a lot of back and forth. And then also with offices, schools, childcare facilities, all of these things closed, families are forced to turn their homes into these multi-purpose spaces. And so daily routines that are ingrained in structure in the home have disappeared and now parents and their kids and even those without kids are scrambling to establish a new normal around school in this uncertain world and when they leave the home during peak times during uh, calmer times when less people are at the store and just always thinking about all of these things that we're constantly questioning with regards to our personal safety so in terms of the first mindset shift that we'll cover with everyone at home, I need to focus on creating structure and order inside to counterbalance the chaos outside. So I'd be curious if anyone wants to write in the chat what their own experience has been around creating the structure and order inside of the home. And if, if it's something that you've been able to find good balance with during this time, or if you find it maybe slightly overwhelming um, to help to have to manage different members of the household and different things that you might be prioritizing with work-life balance. In terms of innovations that we see in this space and areas that were really primed to take off during COVID, because consumers are spending countless hours at home, we see consumers looking for ways to bring structure to the shared spaces. So we see quarantine decluttering. Um, so Marie Kondo was already famous before COVID, but this idea of decluttering the home right now, organizing it, finding joy maybe in spaces that you have not thought about as much Tell you, like, even from my perspective, I'm looking at this corner of my house right now, trying to build a bookshelf in it, which is probably not a space I would have thought about much, much more when I was busy and, and going to work every day. Um, looking at portable pop up office setup. So, those of us working from home, looking for a new dedicated office space, potentially looking for new pop up solutions, looking for ways to co work alongside of your children. So, just an interest in these types of products and solutions and systems during this time. And then also designated kid spaces. So with kids at home for work and play, which Erin just touched on, parents turning to furniture that provides activity zoning. So I think what's really an interesting innovation territory is thinking about new zoning for the home. Um, we've seen this even with home builders where they now remove the dining room in a lot of new build homes and actually turn it into a kid's play space or a kid's area. You may also in your area have seen like kids lofts or kids media rooms or even maybe like a family media room. But just looking at new ways to zone the home that we could potentially have a longer lasting impact on post-COVID, 
just based on the new behaviors that we're establishing during this time. We also see in terms of potentially some future ideas, consumers looking for virtual solutions to organization scheduling needs. So IKEA Japan was one where they offered virtual home backgrounds to those working from home that wanted a clear clutter-free space shown on video calls. If any of you have tried the Zoom backgrounds, um, you know, you can pretty much put anything behind you and now companies are releasing um, different simulated experiences that can take place behind you. So you're not revealing too much in your environment. You have this illusion of safety um, that you're not just putting a video camera on in the middle of your home during this time. Um, we also see virtual organization services from companies like Meet Method where they're offering video conferencing to help you either declutter and organize like your kitchen, your bathroom, your pantry room. Um, so we see consumers are checking off these different projects that they've always wanted to tackle during this time. And then even this future of what a virtual assistant could be look like, juggling work and e-learning schedules, thinking about potentially virtual solutions and systems to help stay organized during this time. We also see a lot of experts emerging during this time that help with different scheduling and calendaring. So thinking about a kid's routine or an activity schedule or a date night schedule, but a lot of experts emerging about how to best zone and use your time so that you're feeling productive and happy um, when you're spending so many hours at home. And then we could imagine some of these behaviors crossing back even when uh, restrictions lift, but thinking about this higher balance of time spent in the home and what that breakdown could look like based on some of the new services we have. So the next mindset shift is around sanitization and hygiene is now a critical part of feeling safe in public spaces. So Aaron alluded to this as well, and I'm sure a lot of us have seen this if we ventured off to the grocery store or Home Depot um, and other spaces that we might have been in. But we see social distancing assistance at almost every retailer. A lot of it is mandated depending on the state or local government. Um, but really reinforcing this behavior that we have to maintain our distance, we have to um, wear a mask, we have to interact with somebody through plexiglass now to be safe. Um, we also see make at home protection. So this idea of sort of this DIY perspective coming in around making it ourselves, which we saw like with bread making, but also in terms of our own personal safety around mask making or other things that we might want to wear to protect ourselves. In terms of future idea, we see more of a hygienic focus for restrooms and other public spaces. So thinking about ways that we could expect new technologies to emerge in these spaces like UV light to promote personal hygiene and touch a lot of touchless innovation, which we also covered on a past webinar. Uh, we see this potential idea that's been floated around about re residential sanitation stations. So home design leaders will begin to incorporate sanitation spaces just inside the main entrance of residences as a way for consumers to keep a germ-free home. So that's a pretty interesting concept. Maybe we could anticipate that even coming into play into restaurants or other areas where there are shared spaces. And then also potentially even more voice activation, replacing touch screens. So avoiding germ transfer on public surfaces, voice activation technology could help replace the need to touch something or even insert your card. I noticed when I have went through the drive through they've asked me to put my own card in now when I'm there. And I'd say it's pretty cumbersome, like trying to reach your hand up, depending on what kind of car you're in, if it's low profile and trying to see what you're doing. Um, and it's, it's actually very quite difficult. Um, so I think this is a really interesting technology to consider for the future. So the last mindset shift that we'll talk about is healthcare facilities may not be able to care for me if I get sick or could pose a risk to my health if visited. I need a way to address my health needs at home. So we see that overall like telemedicine, as we mentioned, has really had such a big shift during this time. It's had more mass adoption during this time where people are looking to really avoid having contact with those that might be sick and also wanting to do that first pass at home. It's something that we expect will continue to see continuous growth even post COVID. Um, telemedicine itself is having 80% year over year growth. That is really astronomical in terms of a category growth rate. Um, so they're doing quite well during this time, and we expect to see more segmented and specialized tele telehealth services, like we alluded to in our poll, more around mental wellness, thinking about virtual ways we could connect with other types of practitioners. At-home health test kits. So we saw this pre-COVID, but home diagnostics really having a lot of growth in the past few years, where you can test from everything from food allergies to other deficiencies you might have. And now there's companies like Everly Well that have an at-home COVID test. Um, and a lot of companies planning to release those to consumers 
as they continue to develop them. So we imagine to see more of this at-home healthcare testing as this first pass before you go into the doctor or go into even an ER. And then personal health wearables. Um, so companies in other spaces like beauty and wellness creating high-tech adhesives. Um, L'Oreal has one called the My UV Patch that provides real-time tracking of UV ray radiation on the skin. So it could be interesting if we start seeing more innovation even in the germ space or virus space or being able to help you identify when you might make contact. So also some future ideas that we see as potential innovation areas to continue to build on is around AI powered medical diagno diagnosing. So we've seen specifically with telehealth, we've seen that as like this first pass at um, before you go to the ER, being able to consult with someone and telehealth really being that, that first station that you might experience before you go see your healthcare provider. And now we see AI really coming into play as well. So we expect that there to be more innovation in this area. Robotic assistance helping alleviate nursing shortages so one thing this has brought to life is really the delicate balance and the nursing shortage that is already taking place. And so using more automated technologies or robotic assistance to help with things that are redundant or don't involve interacting with patients like running errands or dropping off specimens at the lab. And then finally, high-tech medical devices becoming at-home staples. So major medical technologies like ultrasounds becoming more accessible to the masses through smaller at-home versions with connected apps. So that's a really exciting space to think about, just thinking about medical technology being more accessible to consumers and this healthcare really starting from the home first and being able to remote monitor and diagnose before you actually go see a professional. So now we're gonna jump into belonging and love needs. And we'll start with a poll. Okay, so have you or someone you know experienced feelings of loneliness or isolation during the stay at home orders? Yes, no, or you're not sure. You know, you haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about it. Let's see, a lot of people are responding. Appreciate the engagement. At least 60% of you are reporting that yes, you have had some of those feelings, a little bit lonely or feeling isolated during this time. A quarter of you have not felt that way and 12% of you are not quite sure. So this next section here, belonging and love needs, in this new era of social distancing, many consumers find themselves more isolated and alone than ever. And obviously the reasons for that are very, very obvious. And after physiological and safety needs are met, we focus on socialization and creating this sense of belonging. I mean, community is very, very critical for basic human needs. And it's important because humans are social species. We naturally seek companionship and we rely on others to survive and to thrive. So right now, once bustling cities are now appearing deserted, local governments and health officials have closed a lot of these areas. Of course, they're rolling out now and opening some of these spaces, but unstructured social interactions, which form the basis of many of our daily lives, seeing people as we pass or waiting in line at a grocery store, or I shouldn't say grocery store, at like a cafe or something like that, has suddenly disappeared. So just that sense of community, it's just gone away and we don't have that same way of engaging with others. Also, as officials have banned public gatherings of 10 or more, sometimes it's five or 15, depending on where you are, families and friends are finding themselves missing out on in-person events, major milestones. We're coming up on one of the most missed graduation seasons ever at all levels from the pre-K and the kindergarten kids to elementary to middle school to high school and the college students. Um, weddings have been postponed or for those of, um, of those people who are interested in doing it via Zoom, we've seen some unique interesting ways of making it happen, but unable to gather physically, people are scrambling to rethink how do we celebrate these momentous events in our lives and keep that sense of community. And then also keeping distance from others is part of our daily routine. So now when we walk on sidewalk or we go for our daily jog, we have this feeling of like, am I far, farther enough, far enough away from that person? Did they go around me? Did they give me that distance? And so now we're starting to think of mentally how far, how close, how do we navigate people around us, which is a whole new thought process that you know, sounds somewhat detrimental to society, but it's something that we're, it's also to preserve our safety. So I know for a lot of people, that is a major conflict. So the first mindset shift that we'll cover in this section is physical intimacy with others. Even a friendly hug or handshake feels dangerous. So in terms of current innovations that we're seeing out there, we see that 
consumers are looking for handshake alternatives. So looking at ways to say hi or hello, or maybe meet or greet some, a loved one without shaking hands or hugging. We see COVID centric courtships um, being talked about on social media sites like TikTok, where they're sort of reinventing how you might date and courtship during this time and what the modern relationship and love could look like in a post COVID age. And then also quarantine dating apps. So only after confirming you've washed your hands and stayed home for the day will users be matched and given access to a video chat link. So something kind of funny, um, there's even a lot of reality TV. Um, so if you watch 90 Day Fiance, um, they have a quarantining version of the show right now where they cover people trying to do things through quarantine, which some of it includes maintaining relationships, especially with those that for them, for 90 Day Fiance, if you watch the show, there a lot of them are international relationships. So how does love and romance take place at a, at a time like this? So in terms of future ideas, we throw physical chemistry will always be important. Consumers will seek new intimacy practices through non-contact methods. So we see romance and courtship making a comeback because of um, hookups or meeting someone might not be longer an option for a while, or especially if bars may be closed for some time. Um, or even with, with bars opening, there still might be a capacity limit. So just sort of this natural way to maybe meet someone new um, may no longer exist for at least a short-term perspective. Modern dating specialists say that consumers will embrace more traditional ways of courtship. So what we might've seen like in past centuries where um, you write letters or you, know, you talk every day, but just things that um, are kind of a different progression than what we've seen in this like recent past. Gadgets simulating physical presence. Um, so we see gadgets that, sim that simulate a physical presence experience gaining in popularity. Um, some of this is kind of funny to think about, but you could also imagine how even our iPhones now keep us connected through things like FaceTime, where even that was kind of unthinkable that we'd have this much communication through video and texting previously. So it could be interesting to think about how some of these longer ter term shifts could really refocus relationships and what it means to date and find love in this modern age. The next shift that we'll talk about is loneliness is an epidemic and needs to be a bigger health priority. So one of the interesting things that has been talked about a lot during COVID is just this focus on depression and loneliness during this time and how isolation practices and quarantine have really illuminated the widespread issue around loneliness with consumers and activists turning to solutions to sustain connection. So we see innovations around connecting seniors with social companions. Um, so Mon Ami was one that helps seniors who often feel isolated at the end of their lives and fitting them with social college students where they can chat and um, talk with one another and find connection um, in different generations. We also see party parades going mainstream. So this one I think is really fun. Uh, I'd be curious if anyone has had a birthday party um, for one of their kids during quarantine and if you've done something like this where you've had a party parade of friends or family drive by the house um, and it's fun now that even retailers are offering these elaborate car decorating kits that you can buy on sites like Wayfair or Etsy. And we also see therapy pet visits, pet visits go virtual. Um, so Divine Canines is one where pet therapy is goes online so kids can actually interact with a pet um, while they're stuck at home while social distancing. So in terms of future idea, we see consumers looking to grassroots initiatives and new tech to bridge physical distances and relationships. So mutual aid becomes preferred system for helping those in need. So unlike top-down solutions that take time to implement, we see communities creating self-directed campaigns to share resources with, the, with one another. That's been interesting about Austin, um, where EBCO is from, is that it's such a community-oriented city that I've even seen initiatives around helping the, businesses that maybe don't have good e-commerce skills in-house. So leveraging platforms across business types and helping farmers and helping restaurants get online so that they can offer delivery services, but also finding ways to transport food to those in need who maybe don't feel as safe leaving the home, um, potentially like older or more fragile audiences with those that maybe feel more able to go out and buy groceries for them. So we expect this more community focused approach to continue post COVID. Um, I've even seen around like regional banks, um, especially if you've read a lot of articles about the PPP, um, a lot of businesses and online forums talking about going back to regional bankers and really refocusing back on local communities. 
um, because they believe that they're ultimately, that's where they're going to have the best impact or the best service. Um, and they have the most trust following maybe some of the distrust that happened during that process or not receiving a loan or, you know, feeling um, that big business didn't ultimately have their back at the end of the day. The next, last shift that we'll talk about is there must be a way to share physical proximity and limit germ exposure. So knowing that isolating at home is not a long-term solution, companies are coming up with creative ways to get people proximity to others without jeopardizing their health. So we see this in terms of vacation rentals. There's been a lot of articles in the New York Times talking about um, how certain demographics of consumers, you know, when they knew COVID was going to happen, they kind of went off to these elaborate dream homes in New Zealand. But I think on a, on a kind of a more widespread adoption level, we see that vacation homes, when they have sort of this promise that they've been cleaned extensively and they have this checklist or a partnership with Lysol like Marriott does, that this could be a way to continue to travel during this time and even um, into the next few months um, with this kind of promise that it's been sanitized and it will be safe, but you're not having any close contact with others like you might have in a big hotel. Um, we also see this with restaurants, inventing new social distancing barriers. So you can see this is a restaurant in the Netherlands that had these mini greenhouses to help keep staff and guests apart. Um, this is very similar to like the plexiglass that you might experience at the grocery store or at Home Depot. And we also see alcohol-free virtual happy hour activities. Um, so inventing new kinds of social events during this time. So you can see this is kind of a fun one where everyone and their animal get on a Zoom or you put pictures of your pets on Zoom so that everyone can relate um, and find a connection point with one another. So in terms of some of the future ideas that we anticipate, we expect to see more innovation around crowd size. So apps that could tell you when places are crowded, when might be the best time to go there, what might be an alternative that could help create some decision-making in terms of feeling safe and secure um, and being around people at the same time. Interaction planning to create seating plans. Um, so tracking the number of interactions that you might have at work as an example throughout the day, and then creating new seating plans, um, new zoning that could help reduce germ spread and also um, make sense for teams that need to collaborate with one another. And then also th rethinking density concerns around arena and stadium attendance. So we see the event organizers using crowd density models and immune response protection protocols to reallocate space for fans and employees. So rethinking the spaces that we already have, which is similar to when you think of restaurants only being able to have 25% capacity or being able to use everything outside. So what do those new models look like? And what might we experience as a result of this happening longer than a few months potentially around how some of those new spaces might rezone or even new restaurants that maybe open up in the next few months um, if that's a possibility but thinking about what some of the things they might introduce during this time great so everyone given the time with three minutes left we did receive some feedback that it's easier and preferable to end closer to the hour because lots of people are juggling their schedules so to address esteem and self-actualization, you will all get this to your inbox to scroll through and learn from um, and enjoy. And then we will also schedule a follow-up if you care to hear our commentary and have you on, which we love and appreciate. So that's more of the esteem and self-actualization self for us at EBCO is having you on our webinars and being able to engage. So um, you will get some more information. So again, we really appreciate uh, everyone following up and, and joining us today. You will be receiving this deck. If you have any more comments on your way out, put them in the chat box. We will send this to you to explore the rest of the deck. And again, just thank you. Like your participation means a lot to us and we, we really appreciated it today. Okay, I'm unmuting myself just to tell everyone, thank you so much for your really kind comments in the chat box. We're really glad that you enjoyed the content. For us, it was um, amazing to be able to explore this and put it together and be able to share it with you. So again, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and we look forward to future webinars and engaging with all of you when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you.